uh, the, the applicant's planner had testified and he talked about some uh, documentation uh, or some studies that he had, some numbers he had looked at. And um, Mr. Brosman, um, if you could be unmuted, let me just, you sent me both of these documents today, one yesterday, one today, and I just wanna mark these um, as uh, applicant exhibits. George, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, um, Mr. Rice. Okay, so let me identify them. And uh, George, what was your last exhibit number? Do you recall? Um, I'm going to ask my colleague, Dan Rowley, uh, if he has that a, a list. Dan, do you have that? I have it. I have it as A12 as your last exhibit. Uh, I'm sorry, I got more than that. Hold on. Yeah, I think there's more than that. Let me bring up our, our list to confirm. I have A17 as the last exhibit, I believe. Um, A19 is the Hetzel CV. Yeah, so it should be A20, I believe, which is the fiscal impact summary for the project. Okay, so let's 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 mark these. Um, well, the first one is um, summary of annual fiscal impacts, conventional R four district single family detached residential development. So we'll call that, and that's two pages with a table and six um, numbered paragraphs. We'll call that A20. Uh, a I think it would be A21, sorry. A21, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm being told we already have a 20 and 21 and this should be 22. Okay. Guess there's no harm in skipping, so maybe it's better to call it A22, just to okay. be safe. Let's call it A22 then. And um, why don't we put this in? If can you put this one up on the uh, share the screen so everyone can can see this? A22. What's the title of that document? It's summary of annual fiscal impacts, conventional R4 district. It's two pages with a table and uh, five paragraphs underneath the table, five numbered notes underneath the table. While he's doing that, I'm going to mark a second document, which is A23. And this was also discussed at the last hearing. This is a summary of annual fiscal impacts, alternative four bedroom townhome. And that will be A23. These were um, documents that uh, were referenced. Uh, by Mr. Hetzel in his testimony uh, at the last hearing. They weren't offered up at the time. They were requested to be provided and they, they've now been provided. So Ian, they're both going to look sort of the same, but they're going to be different. One's going to say four bedroom townhome at the top and the second one's going to say conventional R4 district at the top. One moment. Okay, so this is the 
one of the questions that came up was the number of bedrooms in each of the proposed townhomes. It was analyzed at a three bedroom. The testimony was that they would be three. The question that was asked, well, what happens to this study if it's four bedrooms in these townhomes? And this is the, uh, the numbers that were run by the applicant's uh, planner. So Mr. Brosman, um, and this is A23. Mr. Brosman, do you have, you wanna provide any additional input on this document? No, as you said, Mr. Rice, I believe, uh, I was not at that part of the hearing I had to leave, but I believe Mr. Hetzel was referring to um, some of these numbers and he was, we were asked to provide this. So we've complied with that. I would note, I think it was stated in the testimony that the value assumed of the $1 million, uh, you know, we think is on the low side, uh, but that was a conservative. But I think it was covered by Mr. Hetzel. Okay. Okay, then. Uh, Ian, can you put up the conventional R4 district table? So this was, and this is marked as A22. Um, the question that came up had to do with um, a conventional single family dwelling, how many units uh, could there be? And then what was the fiscal impact? So these numbers, show or answers to those questions, 31 single family dwelling lots. It would not be a density modification or a townhome development. And then this is the um, net annual fiscal impact. So this is being marked as A22. Mr. Brosman, you wanna provide any other information regarding this? No, I think Mr. Hetzel covered that. And I think, you know, the gist of it is that you know, more school children would be expected from, as a general matter, single family detached homes than townhomes, but I believe he covered it. Okay. Okay, so they're gonna be marked and admitted uh, as part of this hearing. Um, Mr. Brosman, is there anything else you wanna add before we go to the resident's testimony? Uh, nothing at this time. Okay. So um, with that, then uh, I'm going to go through the list of residents that wanted to testify, starting with Mr. Shuda, um, and then go through the list he sent me on March the 6th. And I know some of you have sent uh, written documents. I've sent them to Ian. He should be able to find them. Some I received today, some I received yesterday. So let's start with uh, Mr. Shuda. We're gonna need to have you sworn in first, sir. And our court reporter can do that. Sure. Uh, sir, if you'll raise your right hand, you do solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. State your full name and spell your last place. Joseph Shuda, S-C-H-U-D-A. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Shooter, you're on. Thank you. Uh, first, let me thank everyone, uh, the Board of Commissioners, uh, Habitat for Development uh, Properties, and uh, all the attendees for taking time this evening. Uh, my testimony will encompass uh, several areas of which I will call uh, witnesses to testify as uh, their opinions are going to be considered um, more of a uh, general, I mean, more of an explicit and precise, accurate uh, depiction of what we are trying to accomplish. Our goal is to have um, the review by the board consist of a uh, traffic review, a stormwater review and a density modification review, uh, all of which I think we will be able to present information uh, attesting to each of those. 
Uh, I would like to call our first witness, uh, be it Mr. Greg Verizari. Uh, he will speak to the stormwater uh, issues related to the infiltration systems that are proposed by the developer. Mr. Zari, please. Thank you very much. And shall I swear Mr. Zarian? Yes, please. I don't really see his picture. Mr. Zari there? Yes, I'm here. Your camera's off, Greg. Oh. Okay. Mr. Zari, you. if you'll raise your right hand, please. You do solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. And state your full name, spell your last. Gregory Zari, S-Z-A-R-Y. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you again, everyone. Excuse um, me, um, sorry to interrupt. Um, Mr. Rice, could we have a summary of Mr. Zari's qualifications to having been, I think Mr. Shuda said that he has reviewed the proposed stormwater systems and he's gonna be testifying about that. Could we lay some groundwork as to his expertise to do that? Certainly. Uh, okay. Mr. Zari, let me just ask you a couple questions. Um, and, you know, this is lay testimony. You're not an expert in stormwater management. Is that correct? I don't have formal training in it, no. Okay. And that, that's what Mr. Brosman wants to know, you know, your qualification. But, um, Mr. Brosman, you know, all the residents who live there have firsthand observation as to what's occurring out there. Um, if you find any of the uh, opinions that Mr. Zari gives objectionable, you certainly can object. Um, you know, as you know, this is a zoning hearing and, um, you know, the weight will be given to every witness's um, testimony that it's due by the board. So, uh, and that all bears on the expertise and whatever, whatever comes out during his testimony and any cross-examination. So, Mr. Zari, go ahead and go forward. As I understand it, you're going to comment on, you're going to comment on the stormwater management system that's been proposed by the applicant in this case? That is correct. Okay. Are you going to comment on your firsthand experiences living uh, out adjacent to the property? Is that I'm going to. Uh, touch on that very briefly. Yes. Okay. All right. Go uh, ahead. Go ju ahead. Just in, a, in a, a, a bit of background information. I am a registered architect. I've been practicing uh, in Pennsylvania since 1989. Um, as part of my registration process, I was uh, required to be able to create grading um, of uh, sites. So I have schooling in that, but uh, in a general sense, not in a, in a very specific sense. I do understand how grading works. And for the past 40 years, I have worked in laying out grading on various commercial projects. So I am, I am very familiar. I just don't have the letters behind my name uh, relative to uh, um, specializing in grading. Mr. Zari, you have a, uh, uh, could you just describe your, your educational background? Uh, yes, I have a bachelor's of architecture from the University of Houston. Okay. And are you registered or licensed in the state of Pennsylvania? Yes, I am. Okay. All right, go ahead, Mr. Zari, give your testimony. Okay, so real briefly, I live um, about uh, four houses down from the end of Forest Lane where um, the uh, vacant piece of property that's part of this project exists and is being proposed to turn into a stormwater basin. Um, I have uh, lived in this house for 25 years. I'm very familiar with uh, the property, the subject property. Um, and I have experienced uh, quite a few uh, storm events and flooding. Um, as the township knows, I'm one of the individuals that lost a car in the front of my house uh, due to flooding. Um, where the, the car was totaled, uh, electronics were fried in it. So, um, you know, I have had personal loss in that regard. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to prevent that from happening. <laughs> so I have provided two diagrams um, that I have sent to Ian. And, and if we can call up the first uh, diagram, this uses the site plan provided 
um, as part of the, the package um, that was made public. And what I've done is um, Drew- Mr. Mr. Zari, let me stop you for a minute. Yes. So when you, when you put a document up, we need to identify it oh. for the record and give it an exhibit number. So, so let me just, I'm gonna call this uh, Zari one. Okay. All right. This will be Zari one. And this is a, uh, this is from the Hamilton estate plan set. This is the demolition plan sheet three of 15 uh, with a, I'm looking for the date. Um, Lower right-hand corner must have something, although this doesn't appear to. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Walk isn't populated. No, not not with a date that I can see, but we can look for it later. But it's sufficiently identified. It's sheet three of fifteen. It's a demolition plan for the um, Hamilton Estate, prepared by Site Engineering Concepts LLC. So go ahead, Mr. Zari. Okay, so what I've done, this, this plan represents the existing grading on the site uh, as it uh, currently uh, is. And I've identified uh, watershed lines, the, the blue line that bisects from the upper right down towards the middle, uh, thank you, uh, identifies a little over two acre area where the drainage currently flows towards Eagle Road. Um, at the bottom right-hand corner, there's an inlet um, the water goes to the road on the upper portion, runs down, and, and the inlet collects that water, and then it's um, uh, transferred to the existing stormwater piping that's in uh, Eagle Road. Then the portion in green across the northern part of the site um, has grading that uh, allows the water to drain onto Stratford Avenue as well as uh, onto some properties uh, along Grant Lane. And um, a portion of that area I've identified as 1.98 acres, uh, 96, 1.96 acres um, is the area that I would like to focus on uh, as part of this testimony. Um, that area, um, <clears throat> there's a watershed line that travels east to west as it were, follows uh, the existing grade and topography and the water that falls on that portion of the site, um, uh, as I said, is it drains to Stratford Avenue or to the properties along Grant Lane. And the remaining uh, portion of the site uh, also drains towards the properties uh, on Grant Lane, as well as towards the um, bottom left-hand corner where it um, enters the, uh, the one lot where uh, residents, uh, the, that house is gonna be torn down, proposed, proposed torn down, and then the water continues through to Mr. Shooters and then onto Forest Lane and um, into the stormwater system on Forest Lane. Um, if we can go to the second diagram, please. Okay, and let me identify this. Uh, we're gonna mark this at Sorry, two, and uh, this is the post-construction stormwater sheet, um, five of 15 of the site engineering concepts plan. And I did find a date. These are dated August 27th, 2020. Thank you. Right. So on this site, I've uh, recreated the, uh, oops, there it goes. Thank you. Uh, I've recreated the two watershed lines. And as we could say, see on the right-hand side, the 2.2 acres uh, approximates the same amount of area uh, that the uh, previous document showed. And that water is collected. Uh, it's proposed to be collected into uh, stormwater basin number six, which drains directly into the uh, stormwater line in Eagle Road. Um, a portion of the, the rainwater will still drain off onto Eagle Road because of the steep grade adjacent to, to Eagle Road. Um, we have the green area at the top, which matches 
the remaining area uh, of the previous diagram. And on the left, I took a portion of that and identified that area, the 0.41 acres. That area, based on this current uh, grading plan, will still empty onto Stratford Avenue and will still empty into the properties, um, the backs of the properties on Grant Lane. The remaining green area, the 1.46, will now be collected into the stormwater basins and will be transferred uh, via the overflow piping back down the property and onto Forest Lane. That water, that 1.46 acres, did not drain in the direction that it is being proposed. This is a change to the surface water drainage on the site. This water is being collected and funneled into the stormwater management system, which overflows into the storm pipe on Forest Lane. So what I wanna, uh, what I'd like to do, and I'm trying to minimize my screen here, bear with me a second. Um, It's not letting me minimize. Oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> so what I'd like to do is, is get the Board of Commissioners to understand, as well as the developer, um, and acknowledge that they are, in fact, modifying the, the drainage of the, the current natural drainage of the water on the property. Obviously, they're required by Radnor Township to collect the stormwater and to control the stormwater from the site, but they are modifying it in a way that they're adding additional stormwater to, um, to the drainage system in Forest Lane that uh, it did not have to uh, uh, accommodate. Um, so there, there's a proposed swale along the property line, the back of the property lines along Grant Lane, which redirects the water um, back down into the storm water basin. Um, and, you know, that's a, that's a benefit to, the, to some of the folks that are living on uh, Grant Lane. Um, but the concern we have is that the stormwater system that's being proposed, and it's, this is relative to the high density nature of the property, the stormwater system that's proposed collects the water very efficiently. It pulls the water off of the roofs and pulls the water out off of the street and quickly brings it down into the stormwater basin. It does not give that water a chance to evaporate or to transpire uh, back into the environment naturally. Uh, instead, it, it is collected and concentrated below ground and it is uh, going to be increasing the amount of groundwater um, that the site will be emitting. Now, groundwater is a positive thing, but uh, uh, and a good thing, but unfortunately, too much of a good thing um, is not a good thing. Um, the other concern we have is that there's 800,000 cubic feet of soil that's going to be removed from this site for the basements of the 41 townhouses. That's 80, 800,000 cubic feet of soil, which would normally have been able to absorb uh, uh, rainwater and is, is being displaced. So that again, increases the amount of uh, groundwater that's um, going to be passed along and not being um, uh, held on site or, or at least uh, being absorbed more naturally on site. Um, Finally, we'd like to uh, point out that the enhanced uh, density of the site will create more groundwater filtration to a point of saturation. Um, and then that water will discharge through the overflow system uh, in greater quantities and overtax the stormwater system. Uh, the pro proposed stormwater system lacks surface detention to allow evaporation or a more natural absorption into the environment, such as bioswales, rain gardens, detention ponds, that sort of thing. Um, instead, they opted to go with underground systems, which again, prevent water from re-entering um, uh, the natural water cycle. 
Um, lastly, uh, we're concerned about the amount of groundwater infiltration. Several residents live within a few dozen feet of the underground uh, infiltration basins, uh, and many more live downstream of the proposed development. Uh, we currently manage the existing quantities of groundwater with various means, uh, some pumps, foundation drains, or manually emptying buckets of water, um, which is again something I do um, rarely uh, during storm events. Um, we're generally concerned about an increase in groundwater uh, creating uh, greater flows, um, new points of entry into our basements, increased hydrostatic pressure on existing stone rubble walls, all of the houses on Forest Lane were built at the same time, and we all have stone rubber, rubber, rubble walls, not uh, concrete or concrete block uh, foundation walls. Uh, with exception, I think two houses uh, may have a concrete block. Uh, we're also concerned about undermining uh, foundations. Now, there was no geotechnical survey required for this site, just a percolation test. Um, so we don't know if there are any um, carbonate deposits under the site. Uh, carbonate deposits, as we know, um, can dissolve with higher concentrations of water and create sinkholes. Um, this area is known and is prone to sinkholes. There's many um, instances of sinkholes within just a few miles uh, of this area in, in various directions. So we are, um, we're concerned about that, not only on that piece of property, but on our properties where we're going to be experiencing higher levels of groundwater. Um, no study has been done to that effect because they're not required to. Um, but yet it is a concern. Um, and lastly, the proposed infiltration beds will create a prolonged period of time of this higher groundwater level, extending the time in which um, uh, damage, um, uh, our properties will be subject to the damaging effects of the groundwater. So those are, uh, those are the items we wanted to point out and make clear, and we just wanted it on the record that um, if this property gets approved, it's being approved with the knowledge that <coughs> additional groundwater is being collected, uh, additional groundwater is being added to the storm system, and that storm system enters the drain line in Forest Lane, which historically has proven, and we've made note of it many times, has historically been proven to be inadequate to handle its current demand, let alone an additional uh, contribution of water. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zari. Uh, Mr. Brosman, cross-examination. Uh, yes, please. Uh, Mr. Zari, um, as a um, licensed architect, you would not be uh, permitted under your licensure prepare these um, types of designs for stormwater systems, would you? No, I'm not. And as a, uh, under your licensure, you would not be permitted to make a review of those designs, would you? I do review the designs, yes. Are you permitted under your licensure to review and comment uh, whether they meet um, the township codes? You're permitted the township to do that codes? as an architect? No, sir. How long did you say that you lived at your house? 25 years. Have you installed any stormwater systems there? I have modified the existing stormwater um, management system at my property, yes. Have you identified any provisions of the township code uh, that the stormwater system uh, does not comply with. Yes, I did. Uh, and that is the collection of and rechanneling of surface water and concentrating it to a single point where it exits the property um, uh, or excuse me, yeah, leaves the property and uh, has the potential of causing damage uh, downstream. You say it has the potential of causing damage. Do you have um, any proof of that? that it I have the proof that there's added storm water leaving the site in a very specific area that it doesn't do currently. And the current water creates damage. The added water can only create more damage. 
that's a that's a uh, very unscientific approach, but it's logic. <laughs> and do you um, you talked about a groundwater study? You haven't done any, have you? No, I have not. Uh, nor about sinkholes. A study for sinkholes? No, I have not. Do you have any evidence that um, the um, the stormwater system uh, will cause a specific uh, damage? You're just speculating that it will. I have evidence that I have experienced personal property damage from stormwater in the uh, stormwater sewer system as it overflows. That's all I have at this time. Okay. Does the board have any questions for Mr. Sari? Okay, Mr. Sari, just one question uh, for you. Yes, sir. Um, what part of the stormwater system is, you said it's concentrated and it's going to discharge. What part of that uh, on your exhibit um, is heading in your direction? Well, all of the stormwater basins other than stormwater basin six, which discharges into Eagle Road. Right. All four, five of the other basins inter are interconnected and the single outlet into a sewer system is the only outlet into forest lane, the, the uh, storm line in, in forest lane. So that's being discharged into a, a pre-existing inlet on Forest Lane? Uh, it's being discharged into a pre-existing pipe. I don't know if there's an inlet there. I can't speak to okay. that. Okay, okay. And then once it gets discharged in the Forest Lane, where does, it, where does the water go from there? <laughs> I could be rude and say my front yard, but um, it, <laughs> it travels, it travels <laughs> down the pipe in Forest Lane to Eagle Road, where it enters a PennDOT pipe that uh, leaves the, this neighborhood and enters whatever larger collection system further downstream. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Zari. Um, I have on the list here, Mr. Joseph Fiaco, who I understand is a traffic engineer and has submitted uh, a traffic study, which I've provided already to the board and to Mr. Brosman. And I believe um, Mr. Gato was offering him up as an expert witness. So Mr. Gato and Mr. Uh, Fiaco, are you on the line, please? I am. This is Jim. Okay. Mr. Fiaco? You want to swear? Uh, sir, you do some, if you, yes. You do solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. And state your full name, spell your last, please. Joseph Fiaco, F as in Frank, I-O-C-C-O. -C -C -O. Thank you. Okay, let me, let me just, I'll ask Mr. Fiaco a, a few questions. I know you've been engaged by Mr. Uh, Gato, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And... Um, just briefly describe, Mr. Fiaco, your uh, education, your background, your experience in traffic engineering. I'm a, I'm a civil engineer. I began my career in 1985 in Radnor Township working for PennDOT. Uh, my profession is essentially traffic engineering and highway safety. Uh, my first 15 years was working for PennDOT. Uh, doing traffic engineering work, the various type of traffic engineering work that PennDOT employees do. And, and the last nine years was the, uh, the risk management engineer. So I was involved in highway safety, uh, reviewing design plans and things like that. I, the last 20 years has been in the private sector, the 10 years working for other engineering firms and the last 10 years working for myself. I currently represent two tra uh, townships as their uh, official traffic engineer and I do other work for other municipalities in the field of traffic engineering and obviously do private sector traffic engineering work. I've been accept, accepted as an expert in municipalities and county courts throughout Southeastern Pennsylvania and South Jersey over the last 20 years. 
Okay, and Mr. Uh, Gato, you're offering Mr. Fiaco as an expert witness in traffic engineering, is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Okay, Mr. Fiaco, what townships are you the traffic engineer in? Uh, lower Southampton Township, Bucks County, and Lower Makefield Township, uh, Bucks County. Okay. All right, Mr. Uh, Brosman, do you have any questions on Mr. Fiaco's qualifications? Uh, Mr. Fiaco, um, you mentioned you do some private engineering work. What were some of the projects that you had done? Over, over the past 10 years or, I mean, the private sector work we've done, um, tra typical traffic studies uh, were uh, kind of what Frank Tavani did. We would do an analysis of the traffic conditions uh, superimposed the traffic, the, the, the new traffic that's expected to uh, occur and then uh, come up with mitigation that would be appropriate for the additional traffic that was gonna be generated by the development. Uh, what, uh, could you give some specific examples of the projects that you worked on? Well, the, um, we have a, a project uh, uh, at the intersection of Bristol Road and York Road in Warminster Township, uh, it's a, was a residential home and they are proposing, or Mike uh, is a client is proposing a medical building. So we analyze the uh, traffic at the signalized intersection uh, uh, where the property is and the driveways that are proposed on the two state highways. Um, we have a, I, I could just list projects. Um, we're doing a number in New Jersey. Uh, the, uh, we have a, a a liquor store uh, that we're evaluating right now in South Jersey, down in um, Cape May County. Uh, we have a, a Domino's Pizza that is being proposed on a, a corner property. And we're, again, co collecting the data and analyzing the, the intersections there. We are doing a, uh, a, a restaurant in Galloway Township, New Jersey, same thing. We're uh, collecting data what the traffic is out there, uh, estimating future background growth and inserting the additional trips that are expected with the development and then identifying what impacts need to be done. We have, we're working, we're doing a job for uh, Bucks County Community College. That's on 413 by the Interstate 295 interchange. They are essentially doubling the uh, size of the college campus there. And we are evaluating the, the driveway entrance to uh, 413, which is a signalized intersection, and identifying what improvements need to be undertaken to accommodate the additional trips there. Okay, Mr. Fiaco. Um, Mr. Brosman, do you have an objection to uh, Mr. Fiaco being qualified uh, as no. a... Could I ask one follow-up question? I don't think I have an objection. Do you have any similar projects to this, Mr. Fiaco, a number of townhomes. We uh, recently did a project in Ben Salem Township that involved, I believe it was nine uh, residential properties on a on a township road in Ben Salem. I have no objection. Okay, um, Mr. Uh, Fiaco will be accepted as an expert witness, witness in traffic engineering. And I'm gonna mark the two documents which I received this morning from Mr. Gato. Uh, one is Mr. Fiaco's CV, uh, which I'll uh, mark as um, Gato one. And the second is a um, report, a letter, um, an eight-page letter um, from Mr. Fiaco to Mr. Gato, dated March 8th, 2021, um, which um, I assume you're going to testify to. Um, so that'll be marked as uh, Gato 2. Um, and um, Mr. Fiaco, go ahead. Um, give us your testimony, please. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to refer to my March 8th letter 
Um, we didn't do a, a formal traffic study, um, but due to the, the, the time constraints and budgetary constraints, uh, we, um, we were basically, the letter describes exactly what we did. Um, we did a detailed review of the uh, traffic report by uh, Frank Tavani and Associates. I'll refer to it as the Tavani report. And we also took the cursor review of the site plans. Uh, they were dated August 27, 2020 and last revised December 8, 2020. Um, and we did some field observations. On Friday, uh, February 26th, uh, we were out there between 11 and 1.30. Um, the staff at SAFE observed travel patterns, the behavior, and evaluated intersection site distance on the two proposed access roads and recorded a number of spot speed measurements along Stratford Avenue. Um, at the time of our visit, uh, some of the existing sidewalks where they were present were still snow covered. Uh, several pedestrians were observed running and walking through the area. And, and the following uh, are, are things that we noted on our site visit. And I moved to page two of my letter report. On uh, Stratford Avenue, uh, non-turning motor vehicles were generally observed to be traveling at speeds greater than the posted 25 mile per hour limit, in some cases over 35 miles per hour. Uh, existing and proposed trees in the proximity of, of the nearby intersections, the horizontal curvature on the road, they will limit the available site distance specifically for motorists looking left to exit uh, the proposed road site A and for motorists looking to the right when they exit uh, proposed road B. We observed some operational challenges at the main access point to Eagle Village shops opposite the Lancaster County Farmers Market or Lancaster Farmers Market. Uh, backups from Route 30 were noted. Pedestrian movements and challenging gap acceptance conditions impacted the performance of this location. Uh, this location was not included in the Tavani report. Uh, both the Tavani study and the development impact statement emphasized the value and role of nearby public transportation, including the SEPTA station and bus service. However, the area of pedestrian network within, around, and between the proposed site, the regional rail station, and nearby residential and commercial areas is incomplete. Regarding uh, the bottom of page two, regarding the development of the, and traffic study review, the standards and requirements of Radnor Township um, shall be considered minimum standards and requirements for the promotion of public health, safety, and a general welfare. Our review found that insufficient information has been provided to make such determination. On page three of my report, uh, our, our review found that the Tavani study has not sufficiently evaluated road safety and related conditions. The report includes very little information and no supporting analysis pertaining to roadway, intersection, and pedestrian safety. The lack of focus on safety-related conditions within the Tavani study and a general over-reliance on limited study approach that only analyzes operating co operation conditions, turning movement counts, vehicular trip generation, and vehicle delay together results in a combined development and traffic impact study that does not meet the applicable township requirements. Um, the, the Radnor Township Ordinance states, the transportation analysis shall include all modes of transportation and shall be based on current PennDOT requirements. The first sentence in this section of code states that this very analysis would evaluate the proposed uses impact on transportation systems and the ability for streets and intersections to efficiently and safely handle traffic generated by the development. The uh, Tavani study evaluate all modes, does not evaluate all modes of travel, nor does it applicably consider or evaluate road safety issues in accordance with the ordinance. Uh, moving to, to page four, um, relative to crash data, we, we uh, briefly looked at PennDOT available crash data that's online. You can see a link to the where you can get this crash data on page four of my report. We found the, <clears throat> the annual average 
approximately 81 reportable crashes occur within a one mile radius of the proposed development. Um, within that one mile radius, uh, approximately 38% 38, 38 of reported crashes are injury crashes. Um, relative to angle crashes, there was 48 to 54% of crashes within the immediate area of the proposed development are angle crashes. On page five, roughly 1.7% of the total crashes in Radnor and two different township involve pedestrians, while between four and 4.3% 4 of crashes within the immediate area of the proposed development involve pedestrians. Pedestrian crashes are associated with several common roadway geometric and traffic control related risk factors such as limited crossing opportunities, lack of sidewalk and or crossing uh, conspicuity, excessive speeds, inadequate lighting or site distance limitations. Our review and site visit found several of these factors currently exist within the study area and should be considered by the project study. We recommend that the, the Devani study be updated accordingly. Relative to the lack of sidewalks during our site visit, we observed several pedestrians crossing in the roadway along Stratford Avenue, as well as along and across Eagle Road. There's no existing sidewalk or pedestrian facilities provided. With the current plan, there is no continuous sidewalk along the roughly 1100 foot stretch of uh, Stratford Avenue between the proposed Road A and the existing Stratford SEPTA station, forcing pedestrians to walk in the roadway. Our, uh, likewise, the sidewalk connections to Eagle Village, uh, the primary axis is, is not connected to the, fully connected to the development. Moving to page six, uh, <clears throat> safe measured operating speeds for 52 free flowing uh, vehicles. Again, we, we didn't have, we didn't do a full traffic study, but this, the, we did clock vehicles that were traveling on Stratford Avenue. And, uh, and basically it was roughly between the two proposed uh, access roads, A and B. We found uh, 33 mile per hour northbound was the 85th percentile and 37 mile per hour was the 85th percentile for southbound traffic. Almost all vehicles were traveling over the posted 25 mile per hour speed limit. And, and many, many were traveling more than 10 miles an hour over that limit. We recommend a study be updated to include a speed study and supporting site distance analysis for both of the proposed access points. Relative to site distance, the Tavani study does not include speed information nor an analysis of applicable intersection and stopping site distance in accordance with township and PennDOT's requirements. Based on our review, it appears that the site distance looking to the left from road A and the site distance looking to the right at road B uh, are limited by a number of existing conditions and these conditions will continue to exist with the proposed development as submitted. Moving to page seven, uh, the Tavani study and, and many studies like it use traffic counts for a single day during morning or evening rush hour, but off peak performance, nighttime conditions and other time periods are also important when they're considering the safety performance of a given roadway system. So Tavani study uh, references Appendix C and D, but I was not able to take a look at those, those numbers, uh, which would have included the detailed uh, traffic counts, including pedestrian volumes. The uh, Radnor code relative to the right of way uh, should be 60 feet, uh, does not appear to be met, um, and sidewalks are required. The plan submitted did not show sidewalk provided on both sides of proposed road A and road B. Our review, uh, considering the location of the proposed site, it's, its proximity to the, and propensity to use nearby public transportation, uh, the nearby pedestrian generators, uh, we recommend that sidewalk be required on both sides of the public streets proposed in this project. And lastly, the proposed road B is less than the required minimum distance of 200 feet measured center line to center line from Eagle Road. Uh, we recommend that that issue be addressed. And with that, that was, that was my findings and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Brosman. 
Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Fiocco. Um, you mentioned um, you're a uh, township traffic engineer in various um, municipalities, correct? Correct. And so you have occasion to review land development plans, I take it? That's correct. And in your letter, you cited um, a Radnor Code section 255.24b. That's part of the subdivision and land development ordinance, isn't it? The Saldo? Yes. Yes. And um, you failed to mention 255.24a. Um, that says that the provisions um, are applicable when evaluating plans for subdivisions and land developments, correct? I, what was your question? I failed you to said You failed to uh, reference 255.24a in the same provision, but that says the standards um, are to be used in evaluating plans for proposed subdivisions and land developments, doesn't it? I'll, I'll take your word for it. Um, and we're at conditional use, correct? That's my understanding, yes. And um, are you aware that the um, Radnor Township Engineering Consultants had made a preliminary uh, review of the conditional use materials? I was not provided with that uh, review letter. And are you aware that the Radnor Township Traffic Engineer had also made a preliminary review? I would assume if the Township has a traffic engineer, they made that review. But I, I, I wasn't given a, a copy of that, so I don't know that they did. Um, so you weren't given that to look at or consider? Correct. And if I told you they didn't raise uh, these issues uh, in their review, um, would you be saying you disagree with their review? I guess I would be saying that my opinion is based on the information that I reviewed, so uh, I'm not changing my opinion based on the fact that a, another engineer may have reviewed it and, and commented one way or the other. I, I state what I reviewed and my opinion is based on what I reviewed. You mentioned that um, some speeds uh Measurements were taken, but not a full speed study. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so what's that mean? You clocked some cars that drove by? Yeah, we, we clocked about 50 cars in both directions. Normally, if we were going to do a full study, we would have done 100 in each direction. So it would have been a little bit more uh, a, um, a bulk amount of information, but it's I believe it gives us an idea, it gives me an idea as an engineer what the travel speeds are like out there. But if we were doing a full study, we would have, we would have conducted more, we would have collected more data. Understood. And um, wouldn't you agree it's pretty common that um, people go over the speed limit on many roads? It is, and that's why as a traffic engineer, we would, and we were, if we were asked to evaluate the site distance, we would collect the 85th percentile speed and, and factor that into our opinion as to if there was adequate sight distance or not. We wouldn't solely um, rely on the posted speed limit. In this particular case, Tavani didn't even um, do an evaluation of the sight distance. So I guess it doesn't matter from, he, he wasn't uh, requested to, to take a look at proposed sight distance here. The plans uh, did contain sight distance information, did they not? not the plans that I had. And um, you say uh, 
you would do a, a speed study. Um, not all ordinances require that, um, do they? For measuring site distance? I would think not, no. And sometimes that could be a comment of a township traffic engineer during the land development process? It could be. Uh, as me as traffic engineer, I would definitely comment if, if I was aware or suspicious that the traveling speeds was, was significantly higher than the posted speed. As an engineer, I want to make sure somebody has enough sight distance. It's really independent of, of the posted speed limit. It it's really depends on how fast people are traveling, whether you have enough sight distance. And you do that in your reviews during land development? Correct. You mentioned um, that existing trees uh, might block site distance. Are you aware that um, sidewalks are being installed along the um, road frontages of the property? Yes. And wouldn't that uh, possibly impact on the vegetation that is there? Now, I believe the curvature um, to the, um, let me see if I can, the curvature on, <clears throat> on Stratford Avenue um, to the left of Road A would be outside the uh, property. Uh, so that, that the site distance would still be restricted. And do you know if that vegetation is overgrowing into the right of way? We took a look at what is out there and what was proposed with the plans, and we believe the site distance will still be insufficient based on township standards for that for those movements that I listed. Looking to the left from proposed road A and looking to the right from proposed roadway B. I was asking, you said that you mentioned uh, there was a concern about vegetation off of the property. I was asking, did you determine if that is growing within the right of way of Stratford Avenue? Uh, no. So you don't know that? Correct. You mentioned on uh, page three, if I'm reading it correctly, that the site has a relatively low expected trip generation? Correct. And that's for the proposed plan, is that what you meant? Yes, the number of homes, the vehicular trips, which is what Tavani concentrated on, is not gonna be that high um, to create a, a significant delay over what's already out there. And um, when you spoke about uh, Ordinance 280-135-G-1C, um, if I'm reading your report right, you said that that section um, makes a reference to PennDOT requirements. Is that correct? Yes. And if I read your report right, you agree that um, the study prepared did follow the applicable requirements for PennDOT? Well, it, it generally followed the PennDOT requirements, but it states that it should be looking at efficiency and safety. And the only thing to, the Tavani report looked at was delays, not, not anything to do with safety. I'm focusing on the ordinance language that you cited. The analysis should include modes of transportation. All modes of transportation shall be based on current PennDOT requirements. I took it that you were 
saying that you didn't identify requirements that weren't met. I'm saying that this, the township code says that all modes of transportation should be looked at and Tavani only looked at motor vehicles. He, he did not look at pedestrian uh, trips, which in his own report, he mentions they're expected to be significant pedestrian trips, but yet he never quantifies it or evaluates where those pedestrians are going and whether or not those paths will be safe. You're aware that um, a municipality doesn't have the power to uh, require offsite improvements, are you not? That's my understanding, yes. And I think you um, agreed with me, but to be clear, sidewalks are proposed along the entire frontage of this property, you understand that? Yes. And are you aware of any other uh, pedestrian connections that are being provided? By this development? Yes. There is a pedestrian connection onto Eagle Road proposed on the plan that I looked at. Any others? There's a pedestrian connection on the, I guess it's the west side of the property which and is identified as common space. Is that the one going into the Eagle Village shops? Yes. And you didn't mention any of that, that in your report, correct? Um, not specifically, no. You looked at the crash information in the five county region, uh, correct? I looked at the, the data that's available on PennDOT's um, website where I gave you the link. So I was looking at general rates for pedestrian crashes um, and injury crashes compared to the uh, immediate study area. And then uh, what was your immediate study area? I was a little confused about that. Well, we, we took a, a one mile radius of the, the property location. And then we, um, we cordoned off the roadways uh, that were included in that general area. So you measured a mile from all the sides of the property? Well, I guess that the, uh, uh, we did a radius from the property. You can you can basically put together a, a geographical uh, figure in this case a circle, um, and I and and pull in the, the data that's on PennDOT's uh, database. It's not detailed crash reports, but it's summary information of the type of crash, whether somebody was injured, uh, you know, if it's a pedestrian crash or an angle crash or a rear end crash, those kinds of, those type of things. Was there crashes on the property frontage along uh, Stratford Avenue? I, I don't. It. I don't know. That it got down to that level. And was there cra we crash we info uh, on the property frontage on Eagle Road? No. We, you can request that information if you were, if if I was doing a traffic study, I could certainly get that information from PennDOT and or the municipalities. This was just what's available on the internet. And you're aware that the, uh, or maybe you're not aware, because I think you said something to the contrary, the, the internal uh, drives for the property um, that are labeled road A and B, um, they're not um, proposed as public streets. Uh, did you know that when you prepared your study? 
Well, it's a new intersection. Um, it's a public street in the sense that a number of homes are going to be driving to and from their, their residents along the street. So from a design standpoint, it's, it's a public intersection. Uh, it may not fall, hopefully it doesn't fall under the maintenance responsibility of Radnor Township, but by its nature it would still be designed as a public intersection. But the ordinance is talking about local streets, correct? Well, I believe that would be a local street. It's just not maintained by the township. That's uh, that's your opinion, I take it. Um, and again, um, section 255 that we talked about before that you cited, those are subdivision and land development code sections, correct? Yes. That um, other than the things um, you mentioned, um, did you find any um, any items in the uh, study that you feel Mr. Tavani made an error on? You know, his, his analysis of the levels of service, for instance. I I would say the lack of information is an error. Uh, again. Tavani did not did not do an analysis, any kind of safety analysis. He didn't do any. I'm not asking about lack of information. I'm saying the the analysis that he did. Um, did you find um, issue with that? Well, yes. I'm I'm saying that he he was supposed to look at all modes of transportation and look at safety and efficiency. And essentially, Frank only looked at motor vehicles and delays. He did not look at safety at all. We went over that and you, you admitted that you did not um, mention in your report um, all of the pedestrian connections, correct? I did not specifically. I, I mentioned the pedestrian, the lack of pedestrian connections on the roads that are uh, the road frontage at the site. And um, at the road frontage at the site, I, you agree we're providing sidewalks, correct? You're providing sidewalks on the road frontage. You're not providing sidewalks on both sides of road A and road B. So in essence, you're missing half of the sidewalk within the site. And then once the pedestrian gets to the edge of the property, there are missing connections to the destinations that were called out by your traffic engineer and the, uh, the other report that mentioned how you expect pedestrians to walk to the train station and to the commercial area, but there is no pedestrian accommodations between that property and those pedestrian generators. Pedestrians are walking to the train station today from the area, correct? Correct. And um, the sidewalks that you're mentioning are off site, correct? The sidewalks, the lack of sidewalks are off site, correct. And um, you just said there wasn't a connection for commercial, but we went over there's a, a pedestrian connection to the Eagle Village shops on the plan, isn't there? There's a, there's a pedestrian connection to the shops, but there's a, a lack of pedestrian connection along Eagle Road. There's so, there's there's some yeah, that's off site, correct? Along, there's some combinations of pedestrians along Eagle Road, but there's missing links, so people will be forced to you know cross mid block somewhere or walk along the roadway um, in these areas where you are creating new pedestrian trips. Now, um, again, uh, the section you cited for the sidewalks, that assumes that these are qualified as local streets, correct? They will, they will operate as local streets, correct? No, that's not my question. It assumes that they are qualified as local streets under the law, no, not how they will operate. My opinion is that you should have sidewalk on both sides of that street because of the 
location of the development, the nature of the development, and by your own professionals indicating that they're going to be creating a, a more pedestrian demand than otherwise would be expected. So therefore, I'm recommending sidewalk on both sides of the street, not because of some definition in some, some book. Okay, you're recommending that. Um, that's all I have at this time. Thank you. Okay, so uh, does the board have any questions for um, Mr. Fiaka? And let me just, I can go through the list of wards. Um, I think where we left off last time was Ward 3, Commissioner. Any questions? Commissioner Enderley? Commissioner Borowski? Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you, John. Commissioner Mulroney? Um, my, I guess my only question would be, and perhaps I missed it, um, have you been... Um, have you been contracted to continue to do the study? I know that the time was short and the uh, document review was maybe not complete. Uh, do you have plans to continue um, to monitor traffic and uh, complete the study? At this point, my, my, I guess, scope of work is done with Mr. Gato. Um, I'd be happy to do more work for him, but again, as, as a resident, I, I imagine he's his funds are limited, um, but again, I, it's, I, I did, I think what I set out to do and call attention to the concerns that I have of the proposed development. Thank you, well, it was we, very clear. If we need to do that, we can do that. I yeah, just I just was, I'm not, I'm not asking anybody to do more. I just didn't know if we were going to expect something later. Um, no pressure, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Ebel, any questions for this witness? Commissioner Farhi. Yeah, just two quick ones. Um, uh, Mr. I'm sorry, is it Fiaco. Fiocco? Mr. Fiaco. Um, is our statistics important in your line of work? Yes. Okay. And the other question is, do you understand the phrase, uh, I guess, uh, one data point does not make the trend? Are you familiar with that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Larkin, any questions? You're on mute. Sorry, no, no questions. Commissioner Booker, any questions of the witness? No, no questions. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Fiaco. Um, Gato 1 and Gato 2 will be accepted. Uh, the next resident that I have is Gagan Chawla. Yep, uh, I'm here. Uh, but uh, I think I, I, was, I wanted to talk about the sidewalk and the lack of sidewalk we're going to have after development, which uh, Mr. Fiak already covered it. So I, unless we, um, you want me to repeat it, I can say it again, but I think it's already covered by Mr. Fiak. Okay. Very good, thank you. Uh, Sandy Gargas. Hi. Um, I just, this is not really a testimony, it's just pre uh, presenting more firsthand experiences. This is regarding the sanitary sewer overwhelm because we're, where we're, we're located, is this okay? <laughs> uh, where our house is located is right at the right at the end of Forest Lane, and so it creates a confluence. And our most we are most concerned, and which Greg Greg Swarzy pointed out, with the infiltration beds that are proposed, five of them leading into the pipe at the top of, or right at the juncture within feet uh, of the township line. Um, and all of that flows right smack into Old Eagle School Road. And the video that I had presented or I had um, supplied 
was showing the storm on April, uh, August the 4th, and just standing from the driveway, what was happening coming of the waters coming across from the train station is over to the left and the water's moving down to the right and that's Forest Lane right there. I am at my driveway and that's Forest Lane right across the street there. And where those, those two cones are is where they put in new um, sewer line grates and that was just bubbling up and you can see it's up over the curve, over the sidewalk and where, where you don't see in the farther right, right by the church where those little statues are is where the sanitation sewer manhole cover was and it was spewing like a geyser. And what happened at this storm, which has happened in several of these as Jack Larkin had pointed out today of you know, these hundred year storms that are happening two to three times a year now, um, infiltrating our basement sewer, sanitation sewer line. So much so that in the past, we discovered that our old cast iron had hairline cracks on the backside. And so we had all this sewage coming into our basement. All of that was replaced, brand new. And we continue to get with these big storms, uh, it, because our lateral line hooks, you, if you would draw a line straight down from that orange cone, right where that car is, is where our lateral line connects to the street. So again, I'm going to reiterate the, the fact of having those five infiltration beds leading into the pipe right there on Forest Lane, coming down to what's already an existing problem. So that's what we wanted to present. Thank you. Anything? Mr. Bro Mr. Brosman, any questions? No, I would just like to know for the record an objection. I, I don't see the relevance or any connection uh, beyond speculation uh, to um, the proposed project and that existing condition. But no questions. Okay, the objections uh, noted and overruled. Um, the, um, the next witness is uh, Ted Heimel. When he said overruled. Mr. Heimel. I'm here. Do I need we, to get sworn in or am I yes. good yeah. to go? You need to I'll get swear you in. No problem. You, you do solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. And state your full name. Spell your last, please. Ted Heimel, H-Y-M as in Mary E-L. And I'm at 11 Forest Lane. Uh, first, just a few comments. So thanks to a couple of the neighbors uh, for their excellent preparation, Greg Cesare, Mark Gato, and Joe Fiaco for, for taking some of their time and um, to prepare. So just excellent, uh, and, and we do appreciate it. So um, I moved in, just some background, I moved in in year 2000. So we've been here almost about 21 years. Just wanna give some you know, firsthand experience on what we've seen, firsthand knowledge. We are a couple houses down from Joe Shuda's. Next to Joe Shuda is one of the blank spaces that I think is gonna be made into a, a catch basin or storm management system or something like that, right? So that's where we are, we're on Forest Lane. Um, 20 years of evidence of firsthand knowledge of these 100 year storms as we talk about. Um, data has shown that for whatever reason that we wanna to point to, there's about 20% more rainfall. This has been documented in township meetings with storm water management, et cetera. They're in the lat, we're, we're getting 20% more rainfall per year than we did in the previous hundred years, okay? For whatever reason you wanna to point to, it is what it is. Nobody on this call is gonna change that. It's just a fact that we're getting a lot more rainfall. And to one of the other person's comments, those hundred year storms that we keep hearing about do seem to be happening every year or every other year. So for example, in August of 2018, massive amount of rain. So not only are we getting more rainfall annually, in a perfect world, it would be spread out you know, uh, equally. That doesn't happen, right? It happens in that not only do we, are we getting more rainfall annually, the storms that we're getting are extremely severe. So you've got the double whammy that's right there. So we lost... Uh, we lost our basement, so property loss. I think in one of the same storms that Greg Cesare, one of our neighbors, lost his, his car. 
We have uh, since then put in like some miniature stormwater management systems out of our own pocket into our backyard, which are like many versions of what they're being proposed over there. It basically does hardly anything to be able to capture this type of water. Um, we, we've lost property, major inconvenience. You know, the, the, the things that is just doesn't pass the smell test, right? Are you illegally allowed to do some of these developments? Yes. I, get, I give, I give uh, the developers that, but more rain, more development, less places for the water to go. Just logically, that doesn't make sense, right? We already have aging pipes. This isn't speculation. These are from people that uh, have lived here for 20 to 25 years. We're, we're experiencing loss. We have older pipes. There's not places for the water to go and removing existing dirt to absorb a ton of water adding in more development is only going to exacerbate our problem. And we just feel that it's really just not the density and the number of homes that are being built just does not seem logical whatsoever. So um, that's all I have for today. And if you have any questions, I'll, I'll take them. Mr. Broseman, any questions? No questions. Okay, does the board have any questions of Mr. Heimel? Okay. I have a question. Um, sure, Mr. Hi, Commissioner Mulroney. Uh, Mr. Heimel, I'm just curious, you mentioned that you did some stormwater remediation um, on your own property. And I'm just curious over the years, um, what kind of expenditure, if you can estimate, have you put in so, privately? Yeah, so, you know, it was that, so t I'll answer it two ways. Pre, uh, we did that last year. Um, it was less than $1,000, call it um, $800, right? So uh, out of pocket about $800. Uh, several years prior to that is when we, in August of 18, when we lost um, pretty much half of our finished basement. So that was thousands of dollars. Um, I can get data to you. That was probably 10 grand in losses. Thanks, I just wanted a sense of your financial. Uh, Appreciate the question. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other board questions? We have Mr. Uh, David Willis uh, up next. Uh, Mr. Willis, we'll, we'll need to have you sworn in. And uh, Ian, Mr. Willis submitted a, uh, a document regarding school population projection. Um, and I assume that Mr. Willis wishes to speak to that. So if we can get Mr. Willis on the screen and, and, and have him sworn in. Yes, Mr. Willis, if you raise your right hand, you do solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. State your full name, spell your last. Uh, David Willis, W-I-L-L-I-S. I live at 335 Stratford Avenue. Okay, and Mr. Willis, uh, I'm gonna mark this document that you sent today. It's called Hamilton Property Conditional Use Hearing, Tuesday, March 9th, 2021. Comparison of TESD population projection and those offered as part of fiscal impact study. Um, that's um, TE school district, I assume. Yes, sir. And the document is, um, it's like four pages long. So I'm going to mark that as Willis one. Could I know um, an objection for the record, Mr. Rice? Okay. Um, two uh, for now. Uh, one as to relevancy, it's a different project in a different township and a different school district. And uh, one as to uh, any foundation as to the the project and the uh, and the school district methodology. Okay. Well, you know, as we said previously, you know, in a zoning hearing, um, there was prior testimony of projected uh, school populations in Radnor. This is the adjacent school district. I assume Mr. Willis wants to make some kind of comparison between the two. So. 
I mean, the objections in the record, Mr. Brosman, it'll be overruled. Uh, Mr. Willis, go ahead and provide your testimony. Thanks. Okay, can uh, we pull up uh, the first slide, please? Thank you. So um, around the two hour and 12 minute mark of the previous hearing, uh, Mr. Hetzel mentioned that he was unable to get any enrollment projection information from Radnor School District and offered TE School District's use of the Rutgers model uh, as kind of support for his use of the Rutgers model. So that kind of propelled this direct comparison between what TE has used and what um, Mr. Hetzel pre presented. Um, I will not claim that I'm an expert on this information. I'm merely just going to share it um, kind of on face value. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, this is the cover page of the study that was done for Tredifferent East Town uh, School District. Uh, and I was just going to note here that the title makes it very clear what this document is that I'm referring to. It is a public document available through Tredifferent East Town School District. Um, this particular study was from 2019 and some parts of it, I believe, have been updated uh, in 2020 using similar multipliers, same multipliers to what we'll see on the next slide. So I think we can go ahead and go to the next one. On page five of the study, um, the authors spelled out the multipliers they were using for different types of units. Uh, I think noteworthy here is the three bedroom townhouse. Uh, they were using a multiplier of 0 0.420 for school age children in the Rutgers model. Uh, and I believe Mr. Hetzel was using 0.21 uh, as his multiplier. And again, I'm not an expert, so I cannot attest to why there would be a discrepancy. I'm just merely pointing that out. Uh, I think it's also noteworthy here that the multiplier for rental properties is significantly higher than owned properties. And um, there really is no way to know uh, the, the future uses of uh, the homes in the development. So we can go to the next slide. Um, also on page five of that document, um, I, I found this interesting because one question that came up repeatedly at the previous hearing uh, is each time a study was presented, the, uh, you know, the uh, developer of the study was asked, have you ever compared um, your projections for uh, one of these with what actually manifested as a result of a project being done? And on, on page five, the authors actually did that with one of the developments that took place in different schools where the Rutgers model using that higher 0.42 multiplier predicted 70 school age students. Uh, and then when the project was completed, there was an actual count of 75 uh, students. So I think just in conclusion, um, you know, using the higher multiplier, um, the proposed project of 41 units would yield 17 school age students as opposed to the nine that was initially shared. And, and I think it also just suggests that there's really no reason to believe that we're ever gonna have fewer number of students than what appeared in the original uh, fiscal impact study. So thank you for your time. That's all I had. Mr. Brosman, any questions for Mr. Willis? Uh, real brief, Mr. Willis, do you know, did the study indicate um, just the number of school age children or did it indicate where they went to school? So specifically for that uh, 70 versus 75 number, they actually did pull the addresses from the school database to see how many students attended to a different school from the development. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any board questions for Mr. Willis? Okay, see no board questions. Um, Mr. Sherry. Um, oh. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Mr. The, um, originally, I was planned to talk a little bit about density and 
in the effort of expediency here, much of that was going to be my opinion, which at this point under expert testimony will be just that, his opinion. I, I've decided to incorporate that in a closing argument after Mr. Brosman gives his close. I will incorporate my comments into the close. Okay. Thank you, sir. Then Mr. Shooter, you're the, I believe the last resident uh, witness. Um, if yeah. you're ready to go. Okay. Uh, bear with me here one second. I lost my full screen. There we go. Uh, good, e good evening. Um, actually, I have a couple things I'd like to uh, point out, and it's uh, going to be in support of some of the testimony that has already been given. Um, and I think the videos that I'd like to present that I sent over earlier today to your office, John, uh, will demonstrate to the board the um, overwhelming nature of the flooding. This uh, video that is currently on the screen shows the rear of our yard. And uh, there is a uh, audio section to this video. And as you can see, just looking at our back door uh, and the Hamilton State property is up at that uh, far upper well, left hand corner or thereabouts right straight out, uh, hard to give a depiction. Um, but this is August 4th and the rainwater uh, flowing from the property, as you can see, it's going from uh, the east to west direction. Um, if we start the video, that's uh, the east direction of Hamilton Estate there. That house right there, Mr. Chala's house behind us. Uh, he's adjacent to our property. And uh, subsequently, uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, it goes under the fence. The next video that will uh, give a little better depiction. Mr. Shooter, let me, let me, uh, yes. just, what, what was the date of that video? Um, August 4th of this past summer, August 4th, 2020. Okay. And I'm going to call that Shooter 1, that video. Okay. okay. And we'll call and, this you know, Shooter 2. Go ahead. This should be considered Shooter 2. Now, this is the front of our house. And that fence you see there immediately at the base of, of the picture here is the fence that runs along the side of the property. And you can see behind that fence, that water that's streaming um, to Forest Lane, and that's Forest Lane coming right there where the uh, cursor is currently moving. That water that you can see right there is coming from our property, and you can see the truck coming up the street. This is what Mr. Zari was referring to, and uh, Ms. Gargas was referring to. The amount of water that is flowing and these are the cars that people parked up across the street so their cars don't get flooded out. The storm drain uh, is just at the curb uh, where the, our sidewalk is out front. Uh, and that water that is being collected in that storm drain, and the reason it's flooding is because the storm sewer is already overflowed and cannot uh, discharge any more water into the Old Eagle School main. The flooding then occurs on our lane at the base of our lane, and Mr. Heinel uh, lost property uh, in that flooding. Mr. Zari lost uh, property in that flooding. Um, and the the point I think that is graphically demonstrated here is that the amount of rainwater that is being uh, generated in these storms is significant. Um, the development uh, plans are to capture this rainwater, but as Mr. Zari has already pointed out, that amount of water is going to be channeled into a storm drain that is already in excess capacity status and will not be able to take any more storm water. We are continually getting these rainstorms and if you go back, to, or if you recall what you saw in that first video that was shown, um, the subsequent erosion of our property 
and the potential for sinkholes has already occurred. We've had erosions where I've had Radnor Township come out twice uh, to uh, video, run a video camera through the sanitary sewer to ensure that there were no cracks in the sewer. And the reason I did that <clears throat> is because um, my concerns are that the sanitary sewer that runs from Forest Lane north, I guess that would be, to towards Stratford Avenue that services the homes on Grant Lane, there's a potential, and I think a high potential or risk, that that sanitary sewer, with this continued inundating rainfall, will get washed out and could potentially collapse and cause the township enormous problems. You know, that could be a major event. And I'm not you know, trying to cry wolf here. I'm just trying to indicate that something has to be done to resolve the stormwater flowing. We're going to see this ongoing deluge of rain. I just don't know how successful the stormwater system that's being proposed will help to maintain or eliminate that amount of rain. Um, the last two things I'd like to state are the letters I sent over earlier. And ironically, the one letter goes back to Mr. Hank Mahoney. And I'm sure some of you remember Mr. Mahoney. He was uh, the first ward commissioner. As a matter of fact, and I'm not sure if he was even the president of the board of commissioners at one point. The letter was dated 1999. And it cited the issues that we were experiencing and our concerns, we've lived here for 30 years, and every year we've been subjected to these heavy rains and continuing. The final letter, not the final letter, but ironically, the letter from 2004 that I submitted was sent to Mr. Norsini, who at that time was the uh, township engineer for, to a different township. Mr. Norsini was kind enough to come out that particular morning, um, and this one you can read a little more easily. Um, it was in November. Well, actually, I wrote the letter in December, but it came out in November. And he witnessed firsthand the amount of water that was flowing uh, through our property. Unfortunately, Sir Diffrin and Radner collaborated and put a storm drain on Grant Lane, but they put it in the wrong spot. <laughs> They probably, and that's why I wanted to show that one video where the, the, the piece of ground between my property and the Grant Lane, um, I'm, I'm thinking that's number 12 or 14. I'm not sure what Brogan's address is, but the amount of water that flows down from our property that's not captured by the Grant Lane storm drain is subsequently flowing directly onto Forest Lane, and what is not captured in the storm drain that's on Forest Lane at that juncture overflows and contributes to the flooding on Forest Lane. So all said and done, there's an enormous amount of rain. I don't want to belabor the point, and we need a system that's going to work if this project goes forward. And to be quite honest with you, um, Commissioner Mulroney asked Mr. Heimel the expenses uh, I've had estimates of much as $15,000 to provide some kind of storm um, water maintenance. And, you know, that, that's unconscionable to have to spend that money from something that could be avoided. So thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Mr. Brosman, any questions? Uh, I don't have any questions. Do any of the board members have any questions for Mr. Shuda? Okay, uh, Mr. Shuda, thank you. Uh, thank you. Are, are there any other uh, residents that wish to provide testimony that haven't already testified? Okay, Mr. Brosman, um, I know Mr. Raleigh at the last hearing, your your uh, uh, your associate had um, 
said that you, uh, that you wish to do a closing statement. I think we just heard that Mr. Sherry is going to do a closing statement. But before you start, Mr. Brosman, just a question about the stormwater system that's being proposed. The stormwater system, in looking at the plans, um, and I is your engineer on the line still? Uh, I believe he is, Mr. Rice. And I, in fact, I was going to ask uh, when you finish up if we could have maybe a 10 minute break so I could give some thought about whether I wanted to have any rebuttal. But uh, Rob, are you here? I believe he is. Yes, I am. OK, so Rob, just, you know, there's a lot of discussion here of stormwater and which causes me to ask a couple questions. Sure. Uh, and in looking at the uh, looking at the the plans um, that were prepared, um, you've got the post construction stormwater plan, which is sheet five, correct? I believe that was sheet five. Yes. Okay, and then the um, post construction stormwater details, which is sheet seven. And that shows uh, a number of, and they're marked on the plants, infiltration bed details. So those inf infiltration bed details, as I understand them, are uh, sort of a lattice work of piping underground. Is that right? Cor correct. Um, uh, Radnor Township allows you to count the volume within the pipe, but not the stone. And so we have large pipe systems. Um, they all have stone within them, but they, we only count the volume within the pipe when we do the modeling. And the pipe is not perforated pipe. It's just solid pipe, correct? It's all perforated pipe. Um, so they, they, systems actually infiltrate, although we don't count any of the exfiltration during the modeling. And so all of our rates are, are conservative um, uh, that we actually are showing that we're discharging more, quote unquote, uh, then we'll actually discharge. But even in that more scenario, uh, the area where they're talking on forest lane, uh, where we're connecting, um, a lot of that water that comes down Grant, as Mr. Shuda pointed out, currently goes to forest. And that water originates up on Stratford Avenue. Um, in order to help the neighbors, after we had some stormwater meetings with, with neighbors, we proposed actually collecting some of the water off of Stratford, um, which uh, Mr. Zari pointed out that we're, we're collecting water off of Stratford, which actually gets down to forest currently. Uh, but we, we collected that water and run it through our system. So our systems will actually control the, the rate and volume of that water going through. And then we discharge it out to forest into a controlled system, you know, the system that they were talking about. Um, for a hundred year storm using kind of conservative on top of conservative on top of conservative. And when I say that, I mean, the stormwater basins don't count the exfiltration that will happen. So when water starts to go into the system, it will start to infiltrate, but we don't count that into our model. Um, we then don't count the volume of the stone all around the pipe. And so we're actually providing a lot more storage than we're given credit for um, in the calculations discharging it out to the forest lane area, we're at about 50% of the existing rate that currently gets out to, to forest lane. So we're decreasing you know, the, the rate of water getting out to forest lane uh, into that pipe system, even though we're capturing more water, if that's a long-winded answer to your question. Yeah, I understand that. I'm just trying to understand the mechanics of what's being built here underground. These there's six infiltration beds that are shown on sheet seven, and uh, you know different different sizes, di different dimensions. D does each of them have uh, stormwater inlets that go yes. into? They they each have a, a collection system. We submitted a stormwater report um, to the township. But I want to say uh, it was page 205 and 206 off the top of my head um, of that stormwater report included drainage areas which show what water is getting into each one of those stormwater basins. All right. So when I look at this, there's storm inlets for each of the infiltration beds. And are there outlets for each of the infiltration beds? Uh, there is. There's an outlet structure in each basin. 
Um, they then collect to a pipe network and that pipe network ends up connecting out to Forest Lane for the drainage area we're discussing. So the six infiltration beds are all connected together, flowing downhill, flowing to the existing uh, Forest Lane connection. Is that right? Uh, I believe uh, one discharges to Eagle and the remainder discharge to Forest. Okay. Okay. And they all have these inlets on the surface, I take it? Yeah, there's uh, a whole collection system. So we'll collect roof drains, we'll collect some of the surface inlets. Um, we'll be able to collect all of that. Is the stormwater coming off of the uh, roads and the, and the paved areas, the parking areas into these? Cor um, yes. Also? Yes. Okay. And I, and I like to point out that the existing condition does not have any stormwater controls on site. Right. Yeah, I think everybody's aware of that. So, okay. So, uh, Mr. Brosman's asked for a, a 10 minute um, break. If the board's okay with that, uh, it looks like uh, we're at about 8 30. Uh, can we come back at, um, let's come back at, is 8 40? Is that acceptable to everyone? Fine. Okay for me. Okay, so um, I think everybody can, you know, take whatever break they need to take. You can cut your video however you want to do it, uh, and we'll come back at 840. Okay? Thank you. See you in 10. Um, I think once we have, um, it looks like we have commissioners all back. Um, so, um, Commissioner Larkin, we ready to proceed? Here we go, John. Okay. So, um, I see a plan up on the screen, Mr. Brosman. Um, you intend to uh, present some rebuttal at this time? Uh, yes, thank you for the break. And uh, I don't think it will be lengthy. I'd like to recall uh, Mr. Lambert, the engineer, uh, to talk a little more about um, stormwater management in light of some of the uh, information we heard. Okay, Mr. Lambert, um, you've already been sworn in. You're still under oath. Um, proceed on. Thank you. Um, Rob, uh, you were here at the hearing uh, previously tonight, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And you heard the um, prior witnesses address um, stormwater concerns they had, is that correct? Yes. Did you um, respond to the concerns and um, go over uh, how the system uh, that you have designed will satisfy applicable codes. Yeah, so over uh, the course of, of a year, and actually I know that it was a, about a year because it was my last meeting before uh, the, the COVID lockdown last year that we actually had a stormwater meeting, a specific stormwater meeting with all the neighbors um, to talk about stormwater concerns, uh, explain our system that we were proposing, <laughs> Uh, and, and listen to any of, you know, really what their observations were. Um, a couple of the observations we heard were um, neighbors over on, uh, this is exhibit uh, A4 sheet five uh, that is up on the screen. So neighbors on Grant Lane, which were over to the left, um, had stormwater concerns of both water from Stratford and water from the property uh, reaching their property and going down uh, toward the bottom of the page is Forrest, and that's Mr. Shuda's house. Um, it is actually labeled there, uh, Mr. Shuda. And he talked actually about an inlet at the corner at the end of Grant Lane that, that missed um, capturing a lot of that stormwater and ran through the property and, and made those adjustments. And he had some testimony tonight about that. Uh, at that time that we met with them, we are actually not proposing any basin on the Forest Lane 
uh, property. Uh, we proposed this landscape in that area, listening to the neighbors' um, concerns and, and kind of trading landscape versus the underground stormwater basin is um, there was nearly a unanimous uh, agreement that we should put a stormwater basin there. So we've modified the design and included that stormwater basin on Forest Lane. And, and Mr. Rice asked about it a little bit earlier what these systems are. So these systems are large diameter pipes um, and you can see them roughly depicted on these plans uh, showing how the pipes would be oriented. Um, there's a header in them uh, that connects it all. So when the drop of water falls into the inlets, gets piped to the systems, the systems fill with water. And according to the Radnor Township regulation is, is we only count the volume within the pipe um, because they're concerned if something gets clogged that you can't ever clean it, but inside the pipe you can clean it. And so we've designed these systems all within um, Radnor Township regulation. We've done all of our modeling uh, with the Radnor Township regulation. Uh, and we show that our discharges and infiltration uh, meet and or in most cases exceed um, and exceed by a fair amount the this township regulation um, for both rate and volume controls. Um, so as you can see on this plan, we have five stormwater basins that all drain toward the forest that Mr. Rice was referring to. There's two uh, in the, uh, let's call it the U shape um, in between units uh, 20, what is that, 21 and 35 uh, along Stratford. There's two stormwater basins in that location. Um, there is a stormwater basin adjacent to uh, unit 26. Um, there is a stormwater basin behind units uh, 12 through 15. And there's the smaller stormwater basin we've referred to um, out on Forest Lane. And all of these systems um, are designed to work in concert with one another and, and control the stormwater from the site. And those systems you're mentioning are underground. That, that uh, so is they, they wouldn't interfere with the uh, open space that is shown, correct? That, that is correct. Um, thank you. Anything else, Mr. Brosman? Um, I believe that's it, thank you. Do any of the residents have any questions for Mr. Lambert? Based on what he just said. How about board members? Any board members have any um, questions for Mr. I'm sorry to, to interrupt. This is Greg Zari. I didn't have, uh, I wasn't able to find my square to uh, unmute myself. Um, is it too late to uh, ask no, uh, any questions? No, go ahead. Okay. It's fine. So it, it, was I correct in that the stormwater basins are collecting surface runoff from a greater area than they currently do? The, the basins don't exist currently. So currently they collect Nothing. I'm not sure I understand the question. All right. Uh, I'm sorry. You, you're you're correct. The basins uh, collect water and discharge it um, through the the southwest corner of the site. Is it correct that the basins are collecting more water than currently flows to that south uh, uh, southwest corner? So um, the drainage area. We've you know. Again, meeting with neighbors, there was a concern about the water on Stratford that currently runs down, um, goes down grain and gets out to forest. Um, and so what we've done is captured additional water added inlets along Stratford, which don't exist today, um, to capture that and control it into the stormwater basins. And so we've looked at those, captured those, run it into the stormwater basins and they all collect and discharge into the same pipe that we get to. It just goes in a little bit different route. Um, but what we've done is actually looking at that south uh, west corner that you referred to, you know, let's call it the Forest Avenue connection. Um, that's called a point of interest. So when we do the stormwater management calculations, it's a point of interest. Um, and that point of interest only captures that pre development area that gets to it. Um, is what our pre-development rates can be. 
And then under the township regulation is, is we can't increase any of the rates to that point of interest um, that do doesn't get there. So even though we're capturing more area, we're not releasing any more water, if that makes any sense. Uh, well, what happens to that water, if you could explain it to us then? You're capturing more water. What happens to that water that you capture? Uh, we It's two things. One is it goes into the stormwater basins. There's a infiltration component in the stormwater basins. And then uh, the remainder discharges out into the collection system. Okay. And it, and it discharges where from there? Out into the public stormwater that's out on forest. And then uh, it goes out to Old Eagle School Road. I believe it hits Lancaster Avenue where it cuts across the CVS there and then discharges out into the creek. Okay, so you are collecting more water from the surface and piping it to the point of interest. Is that correct? There, there is no more water getting to the point of interest. You know, the rate of water is how stormwater is modeled, right? And so you have the rate of water getting to point of interest A is actually reduced in a hundred year storm event is reduced based on the, the modeling that's required by the township code by 50% as it gets to point of interest A. And this water, I'm, I'm still trying to understand where this water is disappearing to that. If it's 50%, where is that water? Where is it going to? So, so you're, you're, it's a rate of water, right? So it's a rate of runoff, right? We're, we're measuring a rate and the rate of runoff getting to there is we're we're controlling the water, we're holding it back, we're putting it into infiltration beds, and then we're, then we're slowly releasing that water um, as a rate. Okay, so I think we're, uh, we're talking about two different things then. I'm talking about an amount of water and you're talking about a rate of water. The amount of water that gets to the point of interest is what we're concerned about, not the rate. And the amount of water is what is creating the flooding on our street. So, so what's causing the flooding on your street, and I don't, I have not done a, a comprehensive study um, of the township stormwater system, um, but it is the rate that the rate of water getting to your uh, point of interest, and let's call that your house, your inlet in front of your house, is that there's more water getting to there, the rate wise, than it is able to discharge at a rate. So the discharge rate is slower than the rate coming into it. And when you do that, you get a, you need to hold that water back and that volume. And that volume is, is what you're seeing as, as the flooding. I would suspect, I have not, you know, you, you, you live there, right? So I would suspect that within two hours after that heavy rainfall is that you have very little rain in your, you know, very little water in the street. It does clear out within hours, uh, sometimes two or three, but uh, yes, it does clear out. And so that's a, that's a rate, you know, it's a capacity. <clears throat> okay, so we're storing the water on our front lawns now instead of it being, see the concern I have is that the water has a chance to be absorbed um, naturally in the current condition and during a storm that, that absorption is overwhelmed and the water flows so over the surface. The, during the storms that you're referring to, um, there's, and I don't know if you attended the February meeting last year, um, there's initial abstractions, right? And so the, the soil absorbs a certain amount of water, right? After the water, after the soil absorbs that water, you basically get 100% runoff, right? The water, the, the, the surface soil saturated and you get 100% runoff. So the storms that are impacting you you're really getting the 100% runoff. In my experience, these systems once installed, right, where we have issues of, of people talking about uh, excessive runoff is usually when these systems are not installed. They're on existing houses, right? And so all the houses on Grant and Forest and Stratford, you know, there are a few on Stratford that actually have stormwater basins in them. Um, all of the houses that, that were built without stormwater contribute to this issue and have it run out. In instances where the systems are installed, there's actually a lot of volume. And so not only are we relying on initial abstractions of soil, we actually provide 
large volume. And these storms that we're receiving are very high intensity storms that have a lot of runoff quickly. And the good thing about these systems is they have volume. They can absorb that runoff into the system and, and absorb is probably not the right word. They can control it, right? They capture it, they have a volume. They can, they can fill up quickly and not just run off. And then we allow a controlled runoff leaving the site where if you don't have any of these systems, you have an uncontrolled situation where the water, the initial abstractions get full, and then you have 100% runoff leaving the site. And that's, I think, what you're experiencing today. Do your calculations uh, consider post-development condition of the soil after all of the heavy equipment has worked on it and after the volume of soil from the basements is removed from the site in terms of your percolation and, and absorption calculations? I'm not sure your correlation between the volume of soil and basements and stormwater. I, I did not follow that argument. But um, to answer your first question is, is the, the models consider what is existing on the site, right? Is, is what the current conditions is. We model the current conditions conservatively um, per the code. Uh, we model them conservatively. We actually discount the amount of impervious on the property. And then in the post development is, is we do look at what the soil conditions are um, and, and model it accordingly. Okay. I, I, I think I'm finished though. Thank you very much. No problem. Can I ask a question? Mr. Shoot, oh. you have raised, so go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Lambert, quick question. Two things. Um, you witnessed the video. I think you saw the video that I showed, correct, of the water flow. I, yes, you... you sent me several videos over the past 12 months. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know. Um, and with that said, do you believe that that situation will be remedied by the installation of these infiltration beds? That's the first question. And second, I have three questions. The first question is the infiltration beds, will that remedy the situation? Will there be a, a between uh, the units from 12 to 25, the ones that back up to Grant Lane, is that going to be graded back into the development? For the water to be uh, flown back into the uh, infiltration basin? That's the second question. And the third question, I guess, is um, the displacement of the 800,000 cubic feet of ground. Uh, previously, that ground absorbed water. And yes, it. Currently, the way it's situated today, I suspect that the grading of that property is what's contributing to the runoff that we experience on Grant Lane and Farce. Is that not, with that amount of soil being removed uh, and the impervious surfaces being um, increased, would that not generate more water going into the infiltration units? Am I missing something there? So there was three questions. Yeah, so let, let, let's see if I can answer these in order here. So, so the first question was, you, you asked if the installate, you know, this, that this development will improve the situation right. um, behind your house. I think you said resolve, but we're gonna say improve. Um, so the installation <laughs> of all these stormwater basins will collect all the water from the subject property, right? And so th from this property, we will collect it. I cannot say that the, all the owners on Grant Lane um, that also drain to your backyard aren't gonna continue to discharge water onto your property. We're not picking up the ones on Grant Lane, but off of the development, yes, the stormwater basins are going to drastically improve you know, we're, we're, we're gonna collect all the water and discharge it in a controlled manner. So yes, our systems will work. I can't speak to um, the properties on Grant Lane. 
Um, the second question was, how are we grading the properties between units 12 and uh, what is that 20 up in the up in the corner there? Um, we're going to be collecting all those. So we're collecting the roof drains from those units. Um, we're also collecting it into uh, collection, which will then be controlled into the stormwater system, which then discharges. So yes, we are collecting uh, that area there. Um, if you could, the third question confused me. So if you could repeat your third question, I'd be happy okay. to answer it. By virtue of the fact that the amount of impervious surfaces has increased. You, uh, whatever rain would have normally been absorbed naturally by open space, so to speak, that will not occur, but it will be collected. And I understand that. However, the fact that you now are um, collecting all this additional uh, I guess I'm not sure how to phrase this. I, I'm going to say additional rainwater because normally it would go into the ground. Now it's going to be going into a basin. And those basins are being um, sized to accommodate that additional water. But the natural uh, percolation from those basins, you're relying on that as part of the discharge of that stormwater, correct? So we're not actually. Um, so so, the, so as I answered, Mr. Sorry, not... I believe that the stormwater basins are, are an improvement over that natural condition, right? Once you hit the, where you're experiencing the issue is, is, is extreme storm events, right? And so you have filled all the initial abstractions in the soil and you're getting direct runoff. We are going to actually provide stormwater that still controls it. Even after those initial abstractions are full in the soils, we're going to collect it in inlets, put it in something that has a volume. The infiltration component is only for um, to show that the basins will actually drain down. We don't use that exfiltration. It's considered um, in, our, in our model when we develop the rate. So we ignore that in our model and just say that the water is going to sit there and fill up and then and then discharge, which in actual conditions will actually be better. But we're, we're following the township standards, uh, the regulation uh, on how we do that. And it's and it's a very conservative regulation. You know, I, I think that we're the, the systems are going to uh, exceed uh, the model, you know, it's going to be better than than even the model shows. But to be conservative, that's that's how the the regulations written, and that's what we we follow to draw. Uh, you know, we we drew up here and and solved that problem. So forgive me one last time. Maybe I'm it's finally sinking into my Polish head. Um, the infiltration systems will not um, let water. Uh, exfiltrate uh, out of the system, they will flow into collection pipes that will go in the far plane. All the when those no, water no, no. are collected. So, so we're, we're mixing a few terms here. Um, okay. the, the systems will actually exfiltrate, right? So they will function that way. Our model that we run to say that there's so many cubic feet per second discharging ignores that extra volume that's going to get exfiltrated. And so what I'm saying is, is the stormwater will be better when we put all these systems in and, and we can get into the, the, the details of it, but that's, you know, the, not only the township engineer will review it, um, but since we disturb more than one acre of soil, the county conservation district and DEP actually will issue and it's called the national pollution discharge elimination system, it's phase two now, um, permit to approve our stormwater measures. And so, you know, we have two le other levels of regulation that will review it and make sure that we're modeling it correctly, that we're, um, uh, you know, meeting all of the regulation uh, when we go through the land development process. Okay. And, uh, you know, I appreciate the fact that you said you're going to improve the uh, flow in our yard and that level of flow you know, we've already, unfortunately, 
um, have experienced an enormous amount of erosion. And as I alluded to earlier, you know, the township should be concerned about uh, the potential for uh, and, and take that under consideration to make sure there is no uh, 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 undermining or subsidence occurring under the sewer line because I have a feeling something is going on down there because my property is sinking. <laughs> so I, I, you know, just put that out there you know, for the record, you know, that there's something going on. And I think all the residents on Grant Lane should be equally concerned because that sewer line collapses, we're all in a world of hurt. Thank you. Are there any other residents that have questions for Mr. Lambert? Any board members have questions for Mr. Lambert? Oh, wait a minute. Attendee Michael Lutz raised his hand. Um, Mr. Lutz, you are not a party to this application. So if you wanna make comment, we're going to talk about public comment uh, after all the testimony is in. Um, and at that time, you can make public comment. Um, I'm sorry, my phone is, uh, is going to die any minute unless I plug it in. Okay, there we go. Technology. Um, is there anyone else that any other residents that are parties wish to ask Mr. Um, Lambert a question? Hey, John, it's Mark Gato. Can I ask a quick question, please? Sure. Hey, Robert. Um, love your haircut, by the way. Hey, um, don't you guys have to do this anyway as part of the, you know, writing the rules and regs and code and all that good stuff? We had to do, yes, we do have to do stormwater. We've, you know, added features that we're not regulated to do. Okay. And, and you, meant, you, you mentioned them in this testimony this evening. I can't say I was paying full attention. Yes, we added a basin on Forest Lane. Um, we've added storm inlets out to Stratford. Uh, you know, trying to address, you know, concerns that we heard. Yeah, look, I know you guys don't have to do this, but I think, yeah, and it's kind of not logical to me, but for some reason, uh, just because of where this property sits and it's close proximity to Tredifferin, I, 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 you know, I don't, I don't know how it impacts their systems. And I think that's what Joe and Greg are trying to get to uh, you know, a lot of the systems that this water is going to flow into impacts DE. Are, do you in any way have to comply with their code or double check with their engineers? We do not have to go to Tredifferin for approval, no. Um, what we have to show is, is that we're not increasing our rates of runoff. And that's what we talked about before. Um, and, and our systems all, you know, drastically reduce the rates of runoff. Okay. Uh, the reason I raised the question, because I know the TE people are concerned. So, uh, and they're, they, they kind of wish they had standing, but for some reason they don't. And I'm a TE resident. That's why I'm bringing it up. Okay. Um, well, I have. Do any board members have any questions for Mr. Lambert? about his testimony tonight. Okay, um, with that, Mr. Brosman, anything else? Uh, no more um, evidence. Um, I understand we might have brief closing comments and then talking about next steps, I guess. Yes, uh, all the exhibits that have been marked tonight by the uh, residents will be admit it into the record. And uh, I think my understanding here is that Mr. Brosman, you're gonna go first with a closing argument and then Mr. Um, Sherry um, will do a closing argument uh, for the residents. So go ahead, Mr. Brosman, proceed on. 
Thank you, um, Mr. Rice. Thank you to the uh, commissioners. Uh, we've had many hearings on this application. I just wanted to uh, recap um, uh, where we are in the process and what we've done. Um, Radner doesn't have a lot of conditional use applications. I realize that compared to some other townships. So you haven't done a lot of these, although I know you've done one recently. Um, you know, a conditional use in an ordinance is a specifically uh, permitted use uh, under the law. And it's the applicant's burden to show that the plan, you know, can uh, qualify for conditional use. And then that the uh, plan that has been put forward um, satisfies the standards, the specific standards for that particular conditional use. Um, there's also the concept and it's well established in Pennsylvania law that when a conditional use application is also a land development, which this is, there's a whole separate process uh, for that that follows and the land development process involves the subdivision and land development ordinance and the stormwater management ordinance. And um, generally the law in Pennsylvania is that the conditional use deals with the uses and the specific conditional use standards and then the specific development issues uh, come at land development. Um, so that's why I was pointing out frequently when things were land development issues and we will have a full review uh, with the planning commission and you as the commissioners and importantly your township uh, engineer and your traffic engineer. Uh, so I believe the evidence showed that we comply with the specific standards for the conditional use that we sought. In this case, um, your code calls it density modification. Um, that's kind of a misnomer in my opinion, but what it is in your ordinance, it says that in certain zoning districts, uh, you can do an alternate form of development compared to conventional development. In our district that this property is in, it's R4 residential, which is one of the more denser single family residential districts in Radnor. Uh, we went over the land use plan and showed you that this property was right behind the Eagle Village shops across from the office building. So it's sort of a tra transitional area. Um, uh, and being zoned R4, you could have uh, lots as small as 7,000 square feet, which if you just divide by uh, 43,560 square feet, which is in an acre, that's a general density of 6.2 units to the acre. It uh, doesn't mean that's what you can build on a particular site, but that's the general density limit. Um, in density modification, um, there are specific standards that in many ways are stricter than conventional development. You have to provide for open space. You have to provide for larger setbacks at the perimeter property line. Um, and actually the, in the R4 district, the density is 5.5 units per acre. Um, for uh, density modification. We showed you through the testimony of Rob Lambert and Bern Panzak, the landscape architect, that you know, we met all the standards for setbacks and density and, and um, impervious coverage and building height, all of those things. We went over point by point by point. Um, and um, I think we showed you a nice plan, uh, Mr. Panzak, showed you the plans. I think our plans achieve pre preserving the character of the property along the public roads, Eagle Road and Stratford Avenue. Uh, we have very minimal driveway and curb cuts. Even the uh, neighbor's um, traffic engineer in his report, and I asked him about it, indicated this, this is a low volume traffic generator uh, for a use. Uh, we showed you the very good uh, landscaping plan. We showed you the very good um, stormwater system. The gist of the testimony on the stormwater system, which will be really reviewed at land development. Mr. Lambert showed you how the water was already going. A lot of the water was already going down Grant Lane and down into the area on forest as an accommodation to the neighbors. Some of that water uh, was uh, taken away from Grant Lane and basically controlled into our system. It would have gone down there anyway. Um, 
So we think we have a very good um, plan that satisfies the conditional use criteria. Um, also in this case, we did get some reviews from the township engineer and the township traffic engineer of the conditional use standards. Uh, there were no standards identified that had not been met. Um, importantly, we also took this plan to the Radnor Township Planning Commission. They reviewed it and they recommended it be approved. And um, that was because the plan met the requirements for a conditional use. Um, let me talk to the other part of a conditional use, which has to do with impacts on other properties. The law in Pennsylvania is very clear that when an applicant shows that they're within the bounds of a conditional use, in other words, we're allowed to have this conditional use on the property and we meet the specific standards for that, which I explained to you how we did in our plans, document all that. Um, the law says that when the township allowed this kind of use by conditional use, um, that was being permitted. And so therefore all the normal impacts associated with that were uh, deemed to be acceptable by the township or else it wouldn't have been allowed as a conditional use. So yes, there will be traffic with any uh, development. Yes, there would be stormwater uh, with any development. So the test under the law is not that there would be some impacts, but anybody who would oppose an application has to show substantial evidence, not speculation, that there will be a detrimental impact greater than the normal impact that is expected from this development. Um, we understand the concerns of the neighbors. My client met uh, for many months before even filing an application. And even during the hearing, uh, we expressed that we would continue to work with the neighbors. So by saying this, I don't in any way intend to uh, suggest that their concerns aren't real. Um, we think that, uh, however, they did not meet their legal that could afford to deny the conditional use. <clears throat> but we will continue to work with them during the land development process uh, to address their concerns. And Mr. Howder, spoke of that as well uh, when he was testifying. Uh, we expressed flexibility on looking at another Eagle Road access. We expressed flexibility on the buffer along Grant Lane. And we worked with Mr. Shuda to provide for the enhanced stormwater uh, system. So I don't mean to discount uh, any of those things. Um, we understand them, but um, you know this use is um, a permitted use and the law is clear that it just can't be denied because you don't want development here. Um, we understand this property has been undeveloped for many years and uh, all around the Hamiltons, uh, the area was developed and this property stood by and now we're coming forward with what we think is a very uh, good plan for that, that will meet um, today's ordinances. Um, and as I said, we got no um, specific uh, comments of provisions that were not satisfied and the planning commission did recommend approval. So we would ask that you um, grant this conditional use and um, we will work with you in land development. I should also note, you know, a lot of time was spent and we submitted the materials because they were called for uh, that we submit the information talking about fiscal impact and school age children, we really address that. Um, but I, and I would submit to you, any development will have uh, those things that's expected. Um, I don't think a township can say uh, new development is being denied because there may be school children. That's um, not allowed under the law, in my opinion. So we, we ask that you um, approve this conditional use and we will work with you in land development and the neighbors. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you, Mr. Broseman. Um, Mr. Sherry. Yes, sir. Thank you once again to the board to have for properties, Mr. Broseman. Um, it, it's, it's been a tedious process and I think it's gonna continue for a bit. Um, we along with all of the residents on Grant Lane, the neighborhood do really appreciate actively being involved 
in this process with the hope that, as Mr. Brosman alludes to, that our concerns are actually heard. Uh, a little bit contrary, I'm not going to dispute Mr. Brosman. We have worked closely as we've tried to move this along. There are many, many issues that need to be resolved in land development. As evidenced by the Planning Commission, it was a matter of box checked, box checked, box checked onto the next item. There is a lot of passion about this and it's a lot of passion about the development itself. That there is no question that Mr. Brosman and his associates have provided data that shows that they meet the conditional use requirements based upon the metrics. As the community exists, there's one statement in doing a little bit of research that's stuck in my head and it comes from Radnor's comprehensive plan. And just to quote a section of it, it's to accommodate reasonable growth using innovative growth management techniques, such as transit oriented development, traditional neighborhood designs and other flexible design techniques. And this is kind of the important part that harmonize and enhance the existing communities. That, just take a pause on that the residents for this appropriation under the, under the comprehensive plan, which is not part of this, but it's an overarching portion of this to enhance the existing community. And that's where I say it's a little frustrating in the sense that we've, as everybody has alluded to, we have been at this for over a year now and have to we'll recycle through the whole process again from land development back to the planning commission back here to the Board of Commissioners. It'll be a trying process. We're here for the long haul. That harmonizing to enhance the existing community is a large portion for the residents of the area. Mr. Brosman addressed a little bit of our concerns. The buffer areas, trees are a big deal. There are, from our standpoint, some discrepancies that have been presented, which will be resolved in land development concerning the demolition plan and the affectionately known tree ribbon slide, which has been used multiple times as evidence of what the community shall look like. Part of the reasoning why there is some skepticism among the neighborhoods. Mr. Lambert has done a wonderful job presenting how his stormwater management system is going to work. At previous meetings early on in this process, Mr. Norisini spoke about enforcement and fines and reassured us that all is well. But to go back in time a few years, four houses were built on the corner of Stratford and Eagle, four houses. That builder was in noncompliance, had an inadequate stormwater system, had to be resolved. It was a mess. That mess resulted in a brown river flowing down Stratford Ave every time it rained. That inadequacy is what caused some of the existing conditions on Stratford Ave. So we're a little skeptical. We would love, we are hopeful, as Mr. Shuda has said, that the infiltration beds will control the rate of flow and relieve some of the flooding. When we get to land development, we will again be asked to make a leap of faith that this system will work. We will be requesting that there is a process in place has been talked about during testimony that should the system fail, then what? That affects everybody's home if this system does because the impervious surface is increased by 46% in this development. That's a material change from where we are. So we are asked to take a leap of faith that all of this will work. Before the enforcement actions and everything, that didn't save anything. So again, we are a little skeptical and we will continue to work with Haverford Properties and the Trust to hopefully resolve some of these issues. Traffic in Eagle Road in ways, there are many ways to resolve some of these issues which are not gonna affect the bottom line of the development. It's very simple 
in a lot of aspects, it borders commercial property versus residential property. If the de design of the development can impact commercial property versus residential property, that's a win for all. And that's where we're hoping to get to. It's a little concerning that both through FTA and their traffic study in Haverford properties, for a lack of a better word, I will describe it as a flat earth pr process. Beyond the Radnor line, the world can fall off a cliff. It was heard tonight in testimony that the traffic, the pedestrian traffic, all of that, that's off-site, off-township, not a problem. I knew Mrs. Hamilton personally. As a matter of fact, she gave me one of her prize lilies for being a good neighbor. She was a good neighbor. So as this process moves forward, I would ask that forget about boundaries and the law and let's just be good neighbors. With that said, there are, like I said, there's a couple items we can get into. The margins on this application on a couple items are fairly close on impervious surface and open space. We are talking 1% from the required of the application. Should something change in the design process, those numbers could change and it could therefore not meet the conditional use application. Without going into a deep dive now, we'll save it for land development, but it has been brought up on the number of guest parking spots that are available for 41 units. It's 0.26 of per unit or one parking space for every four units. And who cares about parking spaces, right? But as parking spaces need to be added, look at the plans as stated and find where you find the land where you don't take it out of another category. Do you take away from open space to add parking? Do you add more impervious surface to add parking? And then that affects some of the numbers that are under conditional use. So while this process may move forward, it may come backwards dependent on what comes out of the actual land development and the scrutiny of what is put forth. With all of that said, we have sent, formally sent our goals to Haverford Properties back in August as an effort to help move the process along, let them know where we were. It was our hope that maybe we could work some of it out without all of this. We're now, the process is the process. Those goals were again submitted for public record during the planning commission meeting. I would ask that all of the members of the board, as you go through this consideration, please reread the goals set forth. We have put reasonable goals that affect the community that all go back to that initial statement that I quoted about enhancing the existing community. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cherry. Um, I think with that, um, we can close the hearing at this point and then discuss uh, off the record. Um, how, how the board's going to proceed in, in terms of making a, a decision. Um, and as I've said previously, once the, the record is closed, which is all the testimony and evidence, um, sworn testimony and evidence, then the board has 45 days from tonight to make a decision, which puts us into April um, looking at the calendar. Um, the uh, board has a limited number of meetings between now and the, the, the expiration of the 45 days. And I haven't discussed this with the board, but uh, it looks to me as if April 12th is probably the, the best date for a decision. That's a regular Radnor Township Board of Commissioner meeting. And as we did with the recent conditional use decision, uh, it was an agenda item and public comment could be provided at that time. Um, so that's, that's my suggestion. Um, I don't know whether the board has any other thoughts. I think between now and April 12th, uh, the board 
would meet with me in executive session, discuss the testimony and evidence. And um, uh, because there has to be a written decision. So uh, I'll be putting together a written decision at the board's direction. And uh, that'll all have to happen between now and uh, April 12th or between now and whenever the 45 days runs out. So unless uh, if the board's OK with that, um, let me stop talking and see if there's any uh, issue with that. Uh, I had a couple other procedural things I wanted to address, but is the is the April 12th date good with the Board of Commissioners, I guess, first of all? Yeah. I'm fine with that. <clears throat> okay. John, so, John, John yes. this, this is Norma. I don't know if you can hear me, but I got kicked out. So I'm going to have to um, come back in if you can just wait a minute. Okay. Well, we're off the record anyway, Norma. Okay. What was the date? April 12th. April 12th would be a regular commissioner meeting where okay. the decision, this decision would be uh, basically an agenda item. John, if there's anybody else who, and in public wants to make public comment tonight, we can let them do that, can't we? We can. It's already 9.30. Let's not do public comment tonight. Yeah, public comment is really only required when you're going to vote on something. So there's no voting happening tonight. Um, that's the way we've set these up uh, so that anyone that wants to make public comment can do it the night that it's on the agenda as an actual uh, decision to be made. So um, it looks like April 12th will work for the board. Um, what I would request the parties to do and Mr. Brosman to do, if, if you want to, is um, in these types of proceedings after the record is closed, any party has the right to submit written oral, uh, written argument, legal authority, why the board should do X or not do X, why the board should turn it down, why the board should approve it, how the standards are met. So any of the parties have the right to do that. Uh, I'm going to put a deadline on March 29th for that to occur. So anybody that wants to submit uh, anything in writing uh, to the board, Please send it, direct it to me, um, and please also avoid any communication with the board members about this process, the hearing, the witnesses, extraneous arguments, just, you know, whatever legal argument anyone wants to make, uh, submit it to me by March 29th. I will communicate it to the board, and then the board will have the decision on their agenda uh, for April 12th. Um, additionally, just in terms of, you know, and I know this is a, for most of the residents, this is a, and maybe some of the elected officials, this uh, is a sort of a, a, an odd process. This doesn't come around that often. We happen to have had two, uh, this year in Rander conditional uses. And, um, uh, I just want to remind everyone that the standards that are in play for the decision is the density modification provisions of the zoning ordinance. And if you go on the township's website, you'll see section 280-90 through 280-100. And there's also another section of the zoning ordinance 280-137, which deals with any conditional use standards for approval. So these are the criteria under which the board has to make a decision. Um, specifically, I would like everybody, including Mr. Brosman and the applicant, to address the common open space provisions of 280-91 and how these, this proposed plan meets uh, those requirements, because I think there's some, some questions about that. Um, there's uh, paragraphs A through G uh, in that section. So, uh, I think that that's a particular uh, focus for all the parties, including the applicant, in terms of whether or not this plan uh, meets those requirements. Um, so with that, uh, I don't really have anything else uh, to add at this point. Is there any questions? Let me start with the board in terms of that procedure. No? 
No, okay. I'm good. No, good. Mr. Brosman, any questions? No questions. Okay, any of the residents have any questions about the procedure? Okay. Mr. Rice, I have a quick question. The April 12th meeting. Yes. Will the written decision be made or will it be written by that point prior to public comment or will it, what's the process on April 12th? What will happen is, um, you know, I will meet with the board members in executive session and get the direction that I think is necessary and they decide to give in terms of uh, a decision, a written decision. And, and there's three options. There's it, the application can be denied, it can be approved, and it could be approved with conditions. So you have three options. So I will get direction on which one of those options the board is comfortable with. I will prepare a written document for them and for them only, um, which they will have in front of them when they vote on April 12th. It doesn't get circulated to Mr. Brosman. It doesn't get circulated to any of the parties because it's, you know, it's a it's an attorney work product document, and it'll be on their agenda for consideration and discussion. Um, and there'll be public comment on um, on the application generally. Okay. Um, Thank you. That's good. So that, you know, that's the only way to do this, and you know that that's what's. Uh, proposed. Any other questions from any other residents? Okay, so one other comment. I want to thank the residents, Mr. Brosman, and all the parties. Uh, these are not these are not easy proceedings when you're doing them live uh, in the board. Uh, it's a little more difficult because you're dealing with a lot of documents and um, uh, I appreciate all the professionalism. Um, I always feel like a referee and I need a striped shirt and a whistle sometimes during these proceedings to keep everybody from you know, drawing fouls or, but uh, uh, I, I think everybody got heard and that's the most important thing. And um, uh, I just want to thank everybody uh, before we sign off. So with that, uh, Mr. President, if you want to make a motion to adjourn, I think it's appropriate. Moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 We are adjourned unanimously. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all.